everybody and welcome to Exposed. I'm your host, Joseph Shepard. And you know, each week we dive into the lives of some individuals who may have been on a Drag Race franchise. And you know, you guys loved it last week with this setup and we are back and I have the absolute privilege of talking to the one and only Honey Davenport. doing i'm good that's me i'm honey davenport ow <laughs> ow <laughs> honey um i before we even get into your life i just need to know your opinion on something okay so tonight what before we're shooting this okay so before there's about even, to be the lip sync the, the word tonight and i had ptsd you knew, you I knew. Had ptsd the, the 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 moment she sent last week the moment rupaul said last week everybody was lip syncing and i was like <laughs> No, not again. Don't do this again. Um, so what What do you want my opinion on? <laughs> I would love to walk back in time to that moment for you. Okay. So you guys end up not winning for the challenge because it's the Mariah Carey and Britney Spears thing. Mm -hmm. um, you are in the bottom with five of your other sisters. Yeah. The longest J-Lo dance track plays with hardly any words in it. I know the original so much better, but the problem is that now I hear the original every single time I'm at the nightclub and it consistently reminds me that I lost RuPaul's Drag Race. It's like every time I go to the club, there's a nice good reminder. JLo's Waiting for Tonight plays every single night. There is a dance party everywhere in America. Trust me, I know this. It plays every single, it's like the worst, so amongst Where the worst song. Night? Yeah, it's, it's to to get eliminated to the only thing I could think that would be worse is if you got eliminated to Crazy in Love. Like I think that would be the only thing that, that would, would be, be awful. Worse. They can't afford it, so <laughs> you're lucky. <laughs> watch, watch what happened tonight when oh, we get gosh. off. It's one of the songs. Oh gosh, please! I hope that doesn't happen to anybody. <laughs> it's so good when like like the older seasons when they eliminated people to like Two of Hearts. Like nobody's playing that shit in WeHo. Yeah, nobody, nobody. You know, but like I le I legit either someone's performing it every night I'm at the club, or someone is playing it. Every some DJs playing it every night at the club. It it was uh. It used to be a sore subject. Now I find it quite hilarious that I'm the only girl in the whole franchise of Drag Race that it took five girls to eliminate. That's it. Hey everybody, it's Joseph here, and I am so excited to announce that I am partnering and collaborating with the Yours app. I absolutely love it, and let me just tell you why. Over the course of the pandemic, I started to really lose sense of how I was feeling, being in tune with my emotions. I got, you know, a little depressed. I couldn't go and do the things that I love doing. I couldn't go to the movie theaters. You can't go to the gyms. You can't go to the grocery store and see friends. And it takes a toll on your mental health. And the Yours app came into play in so many different ways. You know, I love the idea of meditation. I have never necessarily took part in it until this app, and I will tell you it has been a game changer. Being able to have a mindfulness area, being able to go to an app, I can do yoga classes, you can do yoga classes, I'm the most uncoordinated person in the world, but it's so easy, especially for a beginner, and I feel like I'm on top of the world being able to do these classes. They have free content on there, so you can go and check it out. On top of that, they have a seven day free trial. So if you're unsure you wanna try it out for seven days free, try it out. And on top of that, your first 30 days. So if you have 30 days to try this thing, you don't like it, you can get your money back. I know you will love it. You will not need your money back. So click the link down below. It is yoursapp.com slash Joseph. And if you go to yoursapp.com slash Joseph, you can get 60% off their annual yearly plan. That's 60% off their annual yearly plan at yoursapp.com slash Joseph. Honestly, it has been such a game changer in my mental health and my mental state, being able to do yoga classes, breathing exercises, meditation, just coming in tune with myself has been great. So check it out, yoursapp.com slash Joseph. 
Enjoy the rest of your video and I will see you next time. I changed, but sure. let me ask when you were on that stage and you had to perform, you ended up jumping off the stage, right? I needed more space. I'm claustrophobic. You needed more space and you jumped off. And right and when it, you jumped off, Ru's face went. She didn't catch that I jumped into a dip and that's okay. You know, mama's of a certain age. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she was like, what's that? I think something's wrong with her ankle. Um, she was like, Ugh. I'm guessing that's what it was. No, um, I mean, also like my emotions were heightened. Yeah. I was trying to do everything that I could possibly think of doing, um, which I don't know if that makes for the best performance looking mm -hmm. back at it. Um, you know, normally when I'm performing, I just like to let people look back at it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm a much more chill person, but in that moment, it was just like kind of like, you know, I was really identifying with the words of the song. Like I've been waiting for that moment. Mm -hmm. And it was so much more than performing a J Lo song. It was like, give it your all, even if that means like, you know, jumping into a dip off the stage, even if that makes Rue make a face, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I rewatched that before I came on here because I just wanted to relive that moment. I have not seen it since that moment. Mm. And I will say to you, there was a lot more chaos than you. Like, like there were other, the wigs were coming off. Outfits were, were coming. coming. Up, I was outfits like, outfits were coming apart. Other people <laughs> jumped off the stage. They didn't make the cut, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> it was, it was, it was a lot of things. Um, and I hope that they learned that that was a bad idea. Oh yeah, because very few people think that that was a great lip sync. The only people who think that was a great lip sync happen to all be my best friends. And. <laughs> Wait, they think that was a good lip sync? Oh my gosh, they think it's, like, some of my best friends think it's, like, it's just, like, a huge television moment, and it's so much chaos, and I'm not that chaotic of a performer, so to watch me lose my shit that way, it's kind of like the meltdown, like, I know. They just liked it because they like picking fun of you. That's, That's like, the height of it. I like picking fun at me, too, so it's all good. <laughs> like... <laughs> Well, let's get into your life. You were born and raised in Philadelphia, right? That's West Philadelphia. Oh, West Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. You got to say the neighborhood. Because West, you okay. Know. Okay. <laughs> so, so born and raised in West Philadelphia. Uh -huh. Um, Let me ask you, I know that when I was doing research on you, there was a lot of, um, I read that your mom wanted you to rap when you were younger. Yeah. And you started putting that into your feelings and expressing how your life was at the time. Is that right? Through like poetry? I was a really awkward, quiet child. Like really just different from everybody else around me. Um, there was like, it, was just, it felt like there was nothing and no one like me. Like mm -hmm. there wasn't anything televised. I mean, I'm, you know, of a certain age now. So there wasn't anything queer on television. Uh, and there wasn't really any things black on television. Mm -hmm. um, and I just didn't identify with my like black or queer community. I wouldn't have a queer community at all. And my mom really wanted me to like talk more and express myself to her more. And my mom grew up in the like eighties and she was, you know, a, a rapper on like the corners with the boys. She was a tomboy. So she used to like rap all the time in the house. And so she like started teaching me how to rhyme, which led to poetry poetry and songwriting, which is my love. Um, but she would, uh, when I would get really quiet and I would hold things in, she'd be like, what if you rap about it? What if you make it rhyme? And then I would be like, well, there's stuff that I don't want to say. And she's like, you're allowed to say whatever you want to, wow. as long as it's musical. And that's uh, how I started writing music. I I love that. Like she did, she didn't tell you to hold back. That's yeah. really, really good. Yeah, she had to break me out because I was just like, I was one of those kids sitting in the back of the room, like, we should be afraid. He's gonna blow up something. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like I was like, we should be afraid of this one. He's holding on to too much, girl. <laughs> get out, get out, get out those lyrics. <laughs> right? Get it out. Let out some steam, you know. So for those who are watching who don't know what West Philadelphia is is like or was like i guess during the time that you were growing up mm -hmm. what was it like growing up well i mean it's the hood and i'm proud of that um it's in uh it just like most african-american communities it's steeped in the black church um and i grew up in a family that's like half muslim and half christian so just tons of religion oh, and wow. god yeah um and uh i will say this I have the most loving and supportive and incredible family. They really love me. 
I'm just a weirdo. Like, <laughs> I'm just different than them. They've never, ever not loved me for how different I am. It just was very strange growing up, never being able to look at anything or anybody that looked similar or like, was similar to you. So it was just like, it was just really strange. You you felt like you were just out of the box, like uh, nobody. I could not wait to get out of there and get to New York. I had cut school in high school. I hope my mom is listening to this. <laughs> um, I cut school in high school um, with my cousin, who actually lives with me now in LA, um, one of my best friends in the world. And we cut school and we went up to New York and like hookied and like played around, or whatever. We didn't really have any money or anything to do, but we just had enough to take the bus there. Um, and I saw people who dressed different than everybody mm. and people like who were allowed to be themselves. And I was just like, this, that New York was actually my salvation. Like knowing that it existed um, was like, there is a place where I can where, go yeah. to that um, I won't be strange because everybody's fucking weird here. <laughs> 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 and it really was that. I was, it was that for me for 16 years I lived in New York City wow. after high school, yeah. And you went to what, AMDA? Is that... I went to AMDA. Okay, so when I, when, I was, when I was starting, when I was in my high school theater, I was like, AMDA, 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 AMDA. What was your AMDA experience like? Oh, it was awful. It was terrible. I wouldn't recommend anybody ever going there. <laughs> and AMDA, if you're listening to this, maybe you should like apologize for how you treated me like a shitty alumni, amongst several other people um, who've had this terrible experience at this overpriced school. Um, you could literally just move to New York and LA and take acting and dance and singing classes anywhere else and not oh thousands and thousands tens of thousands of dollars afterwards um so my end experience was weird and every time somebody asks me about it i like to bring up my musical theater teacher who told me i would never amount to anything and that I'd never be able to get a job even a chorus on broadway and you know what i make more than them in like five minutes on stage now so i fuck off philip george i you know what okay philip george and i said the same thing um before mine was lorraine cotton so philip george and lorraine cotton you have a special place in hell for yeah. telling people things and making them come down on themselves right right and to sell that to like an a actual teenager you know i wasn't I was a teenager in college. I went to a two-year school and I graduated at 19. Wow. Um, and like to say to a teenager that you're never going to be able to do this, like people become what they're going to become way after 18, 19. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So like, keep going. You ain't got it yet. Like not even you ain't got it yet, but you know what I'm saying? But like, like legitimately told me that he wasn't giving me good material because he didn't think I was good enough for it and that I was never going to be able to do this. But look where you are now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in New York, you said, for 16 years. Yes. Um, where did you end up living in New York? Did you live, like, all over? Was there a certain area? Well, all over, but my heart belongs to really two places. Okay. Um, so all over, because when I first moved to New York, I lived on in the Upper West Side, where AMDA is, okay. um, which was hilarious. We weren't allowed to have like boys in our dorm and shit like that. Well, me and my cousin, oh my gosh, we get into so much trouble. Um, we f just figured out that I could like scoot him into my dorm building on uh in my suitcase he could fit into it so he would come <laughs> you put your cousin in your suitcase yeah we would just act like i had like a lot of props to take the acting class put my cousin in the suitcase and then uh, roll him up into my room we used to do this on weekends um and so then i would start bringing boys in that way and then i was like okay you, you're gonna get caught you're gonna get kicked out of school for bringing boys in your dorm so i was like you got to get your own place so i moved to harlem okay. before harlem was cool before it was gentrified it mm -hmm. was like it was so affordable my rent was four hundred and sixty five dollars in harlem on 132nd street that's how long ago i lived moved there that that's cheap Gag. i yeah. i was i was 173rd and broad the first half of the time that i was there mm -hmm. and then i was like 91st and third once i made a little bit more money mm -hmm. but it was that was the most money i think i've ever spent so to get 400 and something dollars girl well I spent most of my time in New York living uptown in Washington Heights and in Inwood. And that's actually where I like started to develop my drag at to a, a legendary bar named No Parking, which was, was my heart. Um, so I had a real connection with Washington Heights and, you know, the food is fucking bomb. Mm -hmm. And the Dominican dick is... <laughs> 
Girl, um, <laughs> I can say dick, right? Yeah, you can <laughs> okay. say dick. You okay. can say anything. I guess I've said worse than that already. Yeah. Um, uh, and then after I made a little more money and I became a drag superstar in New York, I moved to Hell's Kitchen and I did the whole Hell's Kitchen thing so I can be around all the gays. And the dick was even better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's just because it was in abundance, you know. Every yeah, gay, is every like gay, right and there. then literally have every tourist coming because they want to see the gay nightlife mm -hmm. and everything. So they're coming through. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, they were coming through. Oh, they were coming through. Oh, they were coming through. <laughs> so you're doing drag, and I know that I read that your name came from a misspelled, yeah, uh, signature by RuPaul. Yeah, so this is in the beginning. Like I had done drag a couple of times like actual full-on drag but i was mostly like dancing and pumps and with uh, my my brother my be one of my besties uh his name is antoine we had a group called the hunties and we used to perform we actually started out because we used to perform backup for peppermint um that's how what my intro to drag really was. yeah i met peppermint at a nightclub in new york called therapy and i was just there getting my life sipping the therapy die or did industry die Therapy died. It's okay. hush now, and it's incredible. And it really, looks really, really phenomenal. All except for like this one wall on the second floor that has like black fur on it. And I was like, y'all lost inspiration. But the rest of the bar is like stupidly gorgeous. Um, <laughs> just my one hundred percent review. <laughs> but um, but therapy. I was dancing at therapy, um, and uh, Peppermint came up to me and was like, "Hey, would you like to be in my performance at Lincoln Center?" And I'm 21 years old and I'm like, fuck yeah. And so we like dance with Peppermint and then we started like sort of doing our own thing. We called ourselves the Hunties and we would do like performance drag competitions and things like that. Performance competitions, there were tons in New York. Um, and uh, my friend decided he didn't want to do that. His like musical theater career was picking up and he was too grand to <laughs> work in the good old nightlife. Had he known he would stick to it, he made more money. Um, <laughs> gotcha. Um, <laughs> uh, um, but so that that started a lot of a lot of things. And um, I lived across the street from Sahara, and we were really close. Uh, that's how I met my drag mother, Deja Davenport. She was Sahara's best friend. And um, I'm sorry, I, I like talk a fucking lot, okay? Um, <laughs> so, uh, wait, back it up, back it up, back it up, how I got my name. So, I'm with Sahara, I lived across the street from her, and it's uh, around the time that she was on Drag Race, and she uh, took me, I think she hadn't been announced yet, um, but she had been done filming. And RuPaul had just released her second book. And I went to a book signing from RuPaul, and I asked her to sign this book, to the hunties, my my dance group. And mama, I don't know if she had heard the word hunty before. At that point, it was still new. Um, <laughs> not that I tried to read before. I really wish that I could be her, so I don't want to read her at all. Um, <laughs> uh, um, but uh, she signed the book to Honey. And um, I got a booking from a club that wanted to book the hunties. And it was like, maybe our second booking ever and it was for like a decent amount of money and i was looking at my account at 21 years old and going mm -hmm. like you have no money and they want to see the hunties so i was like our group has a different name now it's honey there's no tease <laughs> it's just the one honey. just the one honey it's just the one honey and uh deja davenport my drag mother um uh who i had met through sahara really got me together and made me a Davenport. Wow. And then the rest was history. Mm -hmm. So were you in New York at the time that you had applied for Drag Race? Because I know that you said, what, eight times for you yeah. got on? Eight? Eight times. Was Were those first seven times, did you get further and further? Or was it that eighth time was just like, bam? I got... For, I guess I can spill this tea. I, I say it all the time. So I, I hope it would wonder if I'm in trouble for this. Like, call me and tell me that I shouldn't say it, but just call me for something, please. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, um, I think that of my eight videos, seven of them were a piece of shit. Now, the eighth one was not the one that was great. The seventh one was great. <laughs> so, because uh, I went back and I was talking to Rakam Sakura about this mm -hmm. just last night. I went back and watched them and like, I look 
fugly. And it was like, I was really trying some hard things and it was not right. And like the first six of them were just like awful. And then the seventh one was just like, that's the ticket. That's everything. And I didn't, I did get far and I didn't get on the show for season 10. Uh, and then season 11 rolled around and I was like, you know, that was really hard. I did it the right way this time and I don't think I need a break, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and so I wasn't going to audition for season 11. I was just like, I had just won Miss Paradise, which is a prestigious title in, in New York, New Jersey. And I really wanted to focus on being a good Miss Paradise. I sometimes feel like I sucked at being Miss Paradise because I went on Drag Race. Um, <laughs> but they love me, so it's fine. Uh, and I got a call from casting. They had seen my season 10 tape again, and they were just like, hey, are you not submitting a tape? Because they're due in three days, and we haven't gotten an application from you. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, I'm taking this year off. I'm 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 too cool for school, basically. And they were like, oh, that really sucks, because this could have been your year. And I'm like, so wait, the casting for Drag Race just called me? And so that I should apply. Well, then I'm a dummy if I don't make a tape in three days. <laughs> so the third, the, the very last tape was like, it was the most honest, the most honest thing that I think that I've ever, not ever done, but it was the most honest tape of all of the tapes because I had nothing to work with. I had nothing to set up, nothing to plan. Nothing was planned out. I just said, well, for the next three days, or next two, because it was due in three days and took a day to edit. For the next two days, I'm just going to get in drag. I'm going to make some costumes because I don't know what I'm going to wear for this tape. I'm going to just figure it out. And I made it in two days. Wow. And it was what it was. It wasn't my season 10 audition tape, <laughs> but it was what it was. And it was really honest. It was really honest. And I, I see why I didn't get on all of those other times. And I also see why sometimes people get in on and you're like, how did she get on? Like, that is not even the greatest drag, girl. But like, you can always tell those people are like the most honest, truthful, real people. And that's what they're looking for on a reality TV show. When you say honest in your 11 tape compared to your 10 or the ones mm -hmm. before, what do you mean by that? How did you change? Well, you know, and in, in a way I've even changed more so since then, I've grown into this more since I made that tape. Um, I think before and even during the filming of Drag Race, um, I've always had a clear idea what the package that I was selling was. That's why I've been doing, a, I think, a good job, pat myself on the back, at selling it. Um, I've always been very clear what I was selling. But my audition tape for season 11 was not selling Honey Davenport. It was like, that's what it is, you know? And... Actually going back and watching that and watching some of the seasons um, as they progress, not just the one that I was on, but watching other girls on it too, after I've been on it, it it's helped me uh, tone down my pitch of Honey Davenport because every, every, like my mind is a consistent creation machine. So I'm always, even in my friendships, they're like, why are you pitches a project every week? Why is this a new thing? thing you know like and so I'm, I'm always trying to create mm -hmm. something and it, all of my tapes before were me trying to show how i create things and i just really had no time to do that so it was just like this is what it is it was the basics it was the basics and the the lesson that i've gotten from that and the lesson that i've gotten from watching seasons of drag race since i've been on drag race is that me at my basic is enough yeah. You know, that's that's an interesting thing to say. Yeah. Because a lot of times people are total opposite, you know, yeah. like I need to be totally 100 percent extra than what. Yeah, I'm not. Mm -hmm. And that's OK. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it got you on the show. Yeah. You walked in the workroom. Yeah. You see these girls. I walked there and I was there for like at least five seconds. <laughs> I mean, you, you made it to three, I episodes. It to three episodes and I came back for a makeover challenge. Yes. You know, how I, I know that I also read and I was looking into you said that during the time you were going through very hard time, correct? Whew, it was the worst time. To, that was the other part of it, too. So in the lead up to winning that pageant that I won, Miss Paradise, my mentor, my drag, one of my drag mothers, uh, I had a 
I had a tumultuous relationship with my drag mother, Deja, um, and we're good friends now. You know, we, we worked on, I fucked up, not her. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, I had a, I had a friend who like took me in and under their wing and they were helping me get ready for this pageant. And one of, one of my drag mothers, uh, Michael Perez, Monica Storm, uh, was a really famous or is a really famous uh, evening gown designer. And the reason for all of my pageantry and everything, uh, all of all of that was because of them. And um, two days before the pageant, he had an aneurysm in his frontal lobe. Wow. So even getting my stuff done for the pageant, there was like one garment that didn't get finished and then another friend stepped in and made for me and I still won, so hey. Um, <laughs> uh, on top of that, I was homeless. Um, I guess that's the bigger thing, right, than yeah. where my drag was. I was homeless, I was sleeping on friends' couches um, and I was separated from my partner and my cat because we couldn't all go to the same place. Uh, and yeah, I had just been diagnosed with bipolar and like, it was just like, it was, it just was like, every, it was when it rains, it pours. I was like, I don't have no money for this. <laughs> I don't have no place to live. <laughs> I'm out of can't even see my man and my cat. Like, you know, like, um, it was, it was, it was a lot. And so it was, um, it was definitely not something that I wanted to do at that part of my life, but I had, I'm in some way really happy that like at what I think is so far in life, my worst mental health moment has been broadcast on national television. And only thing that we saw was that I jumped off a stage and fell down crying. Like, great girl, trust me. It was far worse than that in here. <laughs> Were you, what do you like? What was your mind like during that time? Were you beating yourself up? Was it total just like i mean i i still do this to this day and i'm sure that all of us to some level do i um i deal with consistent self-doubt my inner saboteur oh, my inner saboteur has a megaphone like it, it is loud mm -hmm. and um and and i even said that tons of times at drag race and and you know on air things as rupaul was like you know girl that's the devil you're beautiful you're great and then sitting there like i I felt like shit the whole time I was there. You couldn't convince me I was doing anything good. And I felt like that little kid in West Philadelphia. I felt like strange and different and awkward and weird the whole time I was there. Um, yeah, I don't even know how we got there. You're like digging in my life. What are you fucking Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course we're digging in. No, um, I think that the inner saboteur thing is so interesting because it didn't take me... It, I mean, it took me a very long time for myself to understand that I'm setting myself back. Mm. And I know that's a weird thing to say. There's so many times like RuPaul or somebody like, you know, if you can't love yourself, how the hell you love somebody else? Okay, cool. It's words. And that's how I take it. Every time she says that, I just think about how many men I've loved so much more than me. Like, I'm like, I love this yes. so much more than me. Right? <laughs> and you put everybody mm. else's opinions first. Mm -hmm. You put everything like coming down to it first like when i put out videos i'm always like oh my gosh what's this person gonna think what's this person gonna do and then i just started getting to the point where why does it even matter yeah. like if you're living your own authentic life people are gonna see it and they're gonna see the happiness in you right and that's where it goes at the end of the day and you know what people can relate to that yeah people can can't really relate to hi like that 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 doesn't work uh people can really relate to that is a lot like me and as somebody who grew up without seeing somebody who was a lot like them i you know in my work now i find that it's so important to put so much more of myself into it because i do see queens all of the time who are like oh bitch look she's inspired by by honey davenport <laughs> what <laughs> you know um so and and it's because i'm not afraid to be myself and when you're not afraid to be yourself you allow other people especially the ones like you the space to be themselves mm -hmm. and that's really important yeah and when people can see a representation of themselves on television on mm -hmm. the internet and wherever it creates like i guess you would say like the person kind of blooms like mm -hmm. the other like i i'm on the spectrum so i have um, a lot of like social things and anxiety and stuff that comes with it. And I've never seen anybody on a television program that I could relate to until literally about six months ago. And a show came out 
about autism and it was like I was like oh my gosh that person right there that's yeah. exactly and yeah. in that moment I was like I'm not the only one anymore and now mm -hmm. I feel okay yeah and yeah that's it yeah that's all we need that's all we need we just need to relate that's really all it is and and I think that that's one of the beauty of reality TV they do cast all of these uh like types of characters you know what i'm saying but it's the small nuances and people that we discover on these journeys mm -hmm. that make them relatable to all of us and a great reality tv show is good at sharing those stories and uh really um <clears throat> exposing to people that people like them exist yeah uh and i think drag race does a good job of that yeah i i will say they do a good job i will yeah. say though i hear too many sad stories that involve like parents and stuff and i think for me like i i know seeing those things is really great mm -hmm. but there's only so many of those stories that you can put in before like there might be something else that you miss that person like you right. know right you know it is always a part of our queerness to our relationship with our family so it's much. a big question that we ask that we're always asked like how was it how coming was it out? out yeah how was it you know growing up you know like so i understand how much of that has to be consistently explored yeah. on this television show because it's such a big part of our makeup that's so true as queer people you know yeah and i think one of the things that rupaul's drag race does very well is that you, it is giving people the place to be able to tell their stories. And now we have, what, a cast that now includes five trans girls? And it's like, wow, like right? we, we're getting here. Also, Carrie Colby, I think that Carrie Colby is like a godsend to everybody and helping people discover themselves. Mm. I I said um, before, I was like, I would love for her to be like behind the mirror of RuPaul's <laughs> Drag Race. And every season, she just comes in and helps people figure out who they are as an individual mm -hmm. because yeah. there's something about her light. I'm like, she does it. Yeah. She lets people see who they really are. She's got the light. She's got the light. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the light that went out when you got off drag. <laughs> <laughs> the one that I cash into or the one <laughs> How how did it feel? Because I think that you were not in the bottom the first two times. Mm -mm. So for a third episode to come around, you probably were not even anticipating I didn't think that it was going to be a bottom thing for me. And I really was hoping that it wouldn't have been because the first week we had to make something. And like, I I was really proud of what I put together as a package for my runways. Mm -hmm. I think the world was really proud and they after, after they watched it afterwards too. Um, uh, I was hoping to get the show more of that. And I didn't have money to create it. So I borrowed so much money from so many people. Um, some of them turned out to be scammers and things like that and it's craziness. Um, but uh, but I, had, I was in so much debt. And um, so during my elimination, all it just felt like was that I just wasted all of that. Wow. And that I was never gonna make it back or figure it out. Because, you know, an early elimination really doesn't set you up for the life that I have right now. Um, and I'm really lucky and blessed and privileged because a lot of girls have stood in my shoes and went home third and like, welcome back to your home bar for 25 more dollars. Yeah. And that's the story of your life, you know, and that's fine. And that's, you know what, the thing about it is, if I get to continually do drag for the rest of my life and love it the way that I love it, I'm happy. It is a privilege and a blessing that I have YouTube shows and a podcast mm -hmm. coming out and all these other things that, and, and, and traveling and tours and, and music, tons of music. I, a lot of the girls who go home in, in my position don't get that kind of exposure yeah. and those kind of projects, um, which is what I really did Drag Race for. Like what, I really did Drag Race for that. What would you say sets you apart from the other people that do get out third that may not be at the level that you are, be going back down to hometown bars and stuff. What was it about you? Well, what my sisters always say, and this is generally known, you can ask just about anybody in the whole fucking Drag Race franchise. Um, I'm probably the hardest worker. I'm a really fucking ball busting hard worker. Drag is my love, I wake mm -hmm. up just about every day with it as a part of my focus and it is I, I love creating um and I don't just mean doing drag I like direct music videos for other queens and uh I 
you know, every single day I'm working and honing and crafting my, my, my love, my passion. And not that everybody doesn't do that, but like, I don't know that anybody goes as hard as I do every day. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do you get a thrill from being creative? Yeah, until I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> when you are crafting everything, when you are writing song lyrics, when you end up putting out, you know, your videos, how much of the creative process is you versus others? I am a tyrant. Really? <laughs> I believe in collaboration so much. Actually, there's nothing that I've ever done like since Drag Race. It wasn't in some way, shape, or form collaborative. Mm -hmm. I just released an album of collaborations. Um, and uh, my team and I, we create together. But I have a, a real strong say in everything. And if you try to take my say away from everybody... <laughs> 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 but that's what makes the things the best you know when you have a vision for uh -huh. yourself and you're so strong about that mm -hmm. vision and you don't want anybody else to mm -mm. change it mm -mm. that is when you know you have something too yeah 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 um the last the last piece that i actually wrote uh it's called love is god it's the ep that i just released with manila manila yeah tammy brown and lala ree and jackie cox and kevin aviance on it um it was written to be a movie a short movie musical and i got the funding for it and like signed the contracts with everybody for the funding to do it and then like two days before we we're supposed to shoot the person who was funding the project pulled out no yeah and my team had to convince me that I should still release this project. It wasn't going to be my vision of it anymore. So the way that Love Is God came out, and it's still coming out because there's still more music videos coming from it. Um, it just wasn't how I saw it. And like, it felt like killing a child, yeah. you know, like um, I have a really hard time getting off it when the vision changes in any way, shape or form even if it's not my fault, even if it's like, well, there's $5 left in the account, girl. So yeah, you ain't making no more music videos. <laughs> I, I feel you 100% on that because when I was gearing up to shoot my video, I wanted the first scene to take place in a makeshift blockbuster. I wanted them to make a blockbuster and I found a blockbuster sign. I ended up putting down some money on it, got this thing, everything. And then my director called and was like, this isn't going to work. We're probably just gonna have to like cut this. And I was like, Ugh. and when somebody <laughs> says that to you, it doesn't like, it takes you just, ooh. You know, my acting teacher in college used to say, the greatest artist can kill their babies. And I used to think that is just a terrible fucking thing to think and say. Yeah. But it is like killing a child of yours. It's like, ouch, this is my beautiful creation. I can't imagine that it's like killing an actual child. And I don't want to make that comparison because not in today's world, they'll bury me. But, you know, I love the kids, girl. <laughs> but, but, um, uh, but. But yeah, like it, 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 it is like it's killing a, a part of yourself that you create it. And the only yeah. thing that's similar that I can imagine is like, you know, a child. Yeah. Now we know exactly what happened with God and Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, oh. let me let me let me ask you here. Um, you everybody that comes on this show, I always ask them to expose something that happened behind the scenes of Drag Race that didn't make it to air. It can be happy, exciting, scandalous, whatever you want. But what is something that never made it to air that you wish would have? Something that never made it to air that I wish would have. You know, that can I give you two? Yeah, give me Let's two. Do it. Okay, can I give you two? Okay, the first one is my mirror message on the mirror mm -hmm. was never aired. Yeah. Really? Yeah, my message on the mirror. If you go to the episode of mine, it's not aired. Um, I don't know why. Maybe they had to cut it. They were like, her message is fucking boring, girl. Um <laughs> What did you write? <laughs> Was it bad? I wrote, no matter what, let the world see your heart. I hope you saw mine. 
and they didn't hear it. So that, um, I wish Danny gets grabbed. Um, and I mean, that's kind of lame though. That's like, you could have wrote like, you know, I like boobs. It would have been better. Um, <laughs> you could have just said, you know what? I literally wrote on the wall, fuck all you bitches, but like it just gone on. That would have believed went, you. That would have went that on. Gone that would have got on though. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and the other thing is that the episode that I was eliminated in, uh, when we were on the runway, RuPaul looked at me and she said, has anybody ever told you how much you look like Donna Summer? And she like went on for like 10 minutes nonstop about how I look like Donna Summer and what Donna Summer numbers I should perform. And like, then she sent me home. <laughs> <laughs> She said, mm -mm. mm -mm. <laughs> should have been done in the summer. That should have been your runway. That's what I saw for you. So if I ever come back on track, I'm just walking into the workroom as down the summer. Like, <laughs> we're just gonna be. you should, yeah. you totally should. And you should come in with a mirror that has your message on it. Right. <laughs> You're just mirror all over. Right. Would you go back if you were asked? Yeah, I love opportunity. I think that um, I said this when I had my final interview for the season I was cast on for season 11. Um, I said uh, to the producer on the phone, I said, why would you want to do Drag Race? And I said, I think it is the biggest billboard for drag queens. Mm -hmm. Like more people look at this than anybody else. And I think that the drag that I do is worth people looking at. Yeah. And any more chance for more people to see what I've been up to and what I've been creating, not because I have desires to be more famous. I'm very happy with my life. I couldn't imagine. I honestly couldn't imagine that it would be this way. Mm -hmm. um, but if I had a chance to show more people what I create and what I can do, I'd love that. I, I absolutely would. I would love that. Yeah. Uh, I I love that too, and yeah. I want you to talk a little bit more about that as we are, you know, coming to a close. But uh -huh. um, <laughs> what what is up with everything that's going on? You have Love Is God, right? Love Is God just came out. We'll be dropping more music videos from it coming this summer, um, and uh, my YouTube show to fuck. I can't say yet, but just signed to a major. Network. Wow. I know. Exciting. <laughs> That's exciting. Um, and um, I have an awesome new podcast that is in development, but we have, we've uh, recorded the first episode, so I can talk about it now. Oh. Um, doing a new podcast called The Wake and Bake with Jasmine Masters. Oh my gosh. Are you going to be high? Uh huh. Oh, yes. Oh, for, with Jasmine said, Masters. My, one of my favorite things to do. And this is why it came about. One of my favorite things to do is watch Jasmine Masters on her live, getting stoned in the morning while I'm getting stoned in the morning. She lives 10 minutes away from me. I could just go there, but I'd rather watch her live and like be... Um... <laughs> 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 and so like I told her, I was like, I always just like watch you and you know, like, and then she's like, girl, we should do something. So we do, you know, we were sitting around in my crib and we were like, all right, get out the microphone. Let's, you know, you know, make our first version of the wake and bake where we discuss very random topics and stonery topics yes. what your favorite munchies should be this week because it changes you know uh our favorite strands of weed currently because that changes that changes um you know it, it's it's a lot you know how this album makes me feel stoned as opposed to how it makes me feel not stoned like it's wow. very much yeah it's stoner conversation for the beginning of your day and the, the, the goal of it is, you know, I, I wake up in the morning and I take a solid hour to myself. I have my coffee. If I'm getting stoned, then I have a, like a wake and bake joint. I don't, get, I don't wake and bake every day. Mm -hmm. But I do think that it's appropriate sometimes. Um, <laughs> I, I have shit to do. I can't do it every day. <laughs> but, but um, <clears throat> you know, and, and when I have my wake and bake, I like to have something thought provoking, but like not too thought provoking. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like turns my brain on but doesn't like make me think too deep and that is what this show is and it's fun and every single thing that jasmine master says out of her mouth could make me pee my pants like seriously it, so it, it's wild she i will say when i was first starting the show three years ago she was my th Four, third or fourth guest and we had talked and i was so excited because she was gonna come and drag we had planned this out 
Jasmine walks in the door without any drag on. Looks like she she came up the street and she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I have to go to my friend's proposal. So I didn't do it. And I, at that moment, I was like crushed. I was like, Jasmine, no. Jasmine. It only takes her 15 minutes, girl. That's what I was going to say. I was going to say, wait, she pull a wig somewhere. Last week, she walked into, we were doing a gig in Oxnard. And she walked in at, the gig was supposed to start at 7.30. She walked in at 7.27, out of drag. And she said, well, honey's going to have to host this. And I was sitting there like, I fully just had an edible. And I was just like, that is a bad idea. Girl, you need to get in drag. And um, she, <laughs> she like got in the quickest, quickest drag. It took her less than 20 minutes to be fully painted in pads, in tights, in hair, nails, at shave in under 20 minutes. She's Wonder Woman. Oh my god. She's Wonder Woman. She's incredible. Well, it's been absolutely incredible having you here Thank and you. chitting with you and chatting with you. Mm. And then I think that we should do a little a little pod to go more extensive. So okay. like I think that I'll call you up and uh -huh. then we can go over Zoom, we can go into studio, whatever we want to do, and yeah. we can keep talking about Honey Davenport because I like talking about I Honey love Davenport. talking about Honey Davenport. Yay. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank where you. can everybody find you on the socials? You can find me at Honey Davenport Official on Instagram where I'm shadow banned and have not gained a single follower for a year and a <gasps> half. Um I know, isn't that weird? I've had the same following for a year and a half. Um we think it's because of people who were aggressively tweeting BLM. It mm. could be that, uh, but whatever. Um, you can find me at honey underscore Davenport on Twitter, which is mostly where you can see under my clothes because most of my Twitter is my ass. <laughs> that, that's be real. <laughs> um, and then you have, um, we said more videos coming out. You have Wake and Bake coming out soon. Wake and Bake, the podcast coming out soon. And all of my incredible content from my YouTube show, The Fuck, and my YouTube show, Trade, are on my YouTube channel. Honey Davenport official. And that that is a deep, dark hole of like the craziest, stupidest content and some of the most fun music videos you'll ever find. Well, next time we get on the pod, we're going to review some of those and okay. go through your timeline. I'm down. <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure to give Honey all of the love down below. And um, I'm Joseph Shepard. That's the beautiful Honey Davenport. And until next time, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, give all of that good love. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.